Well, good morning again. Morning. And happy Sabbath. Shabbat Shalom. So next week is communion. I'm not going to do a communion sermon because next week I'll do one. We'll do a short one, talk a little bit about communion, what it means. But, but we don't just walk into communion like, hey, any other time. It's a sacred moment. Uh, it represents the Last Supper and Jesus' sacrifice for us. And we have to work on getting ourselves ready this whole week. Um, take a look at um, issues you have with other people, resentments, uh, grudges, um, things that are left undone, apologies that should have been made that weren't. And let's, let's work on getting that done uh, this week so when we come into communion next week that our hearts are prepared and ready to go. So the question is, are you ready? Are you ready for communion? Um, and, and are you ready for more? Are you ready for this whole thing to come to an end? I'm ready. I mean, I'm ready in the sense that I'm, I'm over this. I'm over this noise and confusion and chaos and, and everything that's going on. I'm ready for the Lord to come. In fact, we were, we were talking about, I think, at either dinner last night or breakfast this morning, about Susan and I, we're ready. But, but Harrison and Rebecca are there, and they're significantly younger than we are. And we're wondering, well, you know, it's, maybe it's easier for us to be ready because we're old and tired and <laughs> we're exhausted, you know. We're just like done with this. But, but younger folks, I imagine, have, still have hopes. <laughs> I don't mean it that way like we don't, but, but still have this sort of longer future that they look forward to. And maybe it's more difficult. I don't know. I don't know. But I know that, that what we are promised in eternal life is so significantly better than anything we can imagine that we could have here on this earth, that we need to be prepared. You know, Solomon in Ecclesiastes says that we should spend more, I'm going to paraphrase, we should spend more time focusing on funerals than on parties, right? On death than on life, because we focus on life all the time. That's all what we think about. We don't think about death, and it wasn't a morbid suggestion that he made. Um, it was an idea of trying to focus more on understanding what we need to do in order to prepare ourselves for eternity. I know I've asked you this question before, and I'll ask it again. How many want to go to heaven? How many would like to go today? How many want to die today? Eh, see, not as many people raise their hands. And, and we're missing a step, right? There's a rite of passage to, to, to get from this. Um, it's sort of like a quantum theory, right? To get from here to there, we have to sort of um, pass over this particular place where we are at. And we have to be prepared to do that. Let us pray. Dear Lord, again, I, I praise you for your gift that you gave us of your son. And for the Sabbath day, I'd ask that these would be your words today. And not mine, that your presence would be here and that you would keep us safe. I pray in your precious name. Amen. So Deuteronomy 31.6 says, Be strong and of good courage. I don't know if there's bad courage, right? But, but good courage. Courage in the Lord is what, if you go back to the original language, is what it's saying. Do not fear, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you, and he will not forsake you. When I was in the military, the, the one characteristic that I learned was the most important, and I carry it to my life today, is loyalty. I consider loyalty to, be, loyalty to be on the very top of all of the characteristics, human characteristics that I could possess. There were men who, who fought beside me that were willing to give their lives for me. Some did give their lives for others, and I was willing to do the same for them. I would take a bullet for them. That's what loyalty um, is about. Jesus' loyalty towards us was such that he wasn't afraid to die in order to give us all hope for eternity. And we should not be afraid of that either. Don't fear that which can take the mortal life, right? Fear that which takes our soul. Not this. The problem is, is that human beings are subject to human frailty. I mean... I think I'm a loyalist. I, I like to believe that, but I don't know. If I was being tortured, I just don't know. Maybe you'd have to slap me to shut me up. I'm not sure what would happen. 
you know? And in these end days when it comes, these final days come and we are subject to significant persecution, we have to remember that while the people around us may begin to falter and fail, that the Lord never does and never will. So while we can, we can trust in our relationships with other people, we have to be very careful not to put all of our eggs in that person basket, the human basket, because as people begin to fall and we might feel betrayed, it's easier to lose faith. If we keep our eggs in God's basket, it'll never happen because God will never, as it says here, leave us and he will never forsake us. Amen? Amen. Well, let's prepare together because I don't know about you, but I can't do this alone. I don't have the strength, the wisdom, uh, the wherewithal, the endurance that it takes in order to try to prepare for the end days all by myself, to be the lone Christian out there who thinks that I can handle this and fight off uh, the satanic influences all alone. Matthew 24, 6 through 8 says, And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Did you hear that? Don't panic. Yet these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. I don't know about you, but my heart groans for this world. I have heart pains sometimes. Um, I, I don't know even how to describe it. It's not sadness. It's this, um, this sense of uh, not hopelessness either. I guess if you experience it, I, I don't have to explain it, but it's this sort of strong sensation about the poor folks who are not getting this message and what's going to happen to them when the end comes. Right? We're told that the road to, um, to eternal life is narrow, and few will be on it. But the road to, to being lost is wide, and there will be many. But it's interesting. I like, uh, as, a, as a mathematician, I, I, I strive for quantification of things. But few doesn't tell me anything. I don't know what that means. What's the ratio of those that are saved to loss? Is it 10 to 90? Is it 20 to 80 percent? I, I wouldn't have a clue. But when the Bible says that few are saved and many are lost, then my heart um, groans, if you will, for all of these problems in the world, for those people who are not believers and who end up in a state of hopelessness and despair because they don't have Jesus in their lives. I was talking to some friends of mine at a, at a get-together not too long ago, and it was a, a couple guys, they're, they're um, African-American, and they said to me, they said, man, what causes racism? I mean, what causes it? Why are people racist, is what he asked me. And I said, because they don't have Jesus. That's really all it's about. That is the answer to that whole thing. Romans 8, 22 and 23 says, For we all know, we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan. Even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of the future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. Amen. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children including the new bodies that he has promised. I'll just take a new spine and <laughs> leave all the stuff that goes around it. I can handle that. <clears throat> but I look forward to those days because, you know, chronic pain sufferers experience things that other people may not realize. The amount of stress and anxiety and depression that accompanies chronic pain is just endemic. And, and I was reading somewhere, something like close to 40% of the population now suffers from chronic pain in one form or another. Wouldn't it be nice to have new bodies and not to experience um, that? But we also know that many will be deceived. Matthew 24, 4 to 6, go back a couple verses, says that Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah, 
they will deceive many. I, I put this article up here because I've kind of been following this a bit. This is a little older. It's actually 2020, so it's a, a year, a uh, year and a half, almost two years old. But the rabbis, these rabbis, or rebbies actually, they're rebbies, which are the rabbis of the rabbis. They're like the Gamaliels were in the Sanhedrin. And they, um, uh, they claim uh, to be in negotiations right now, meetings with the Messiah. He's here, he's in Israel, and he's, I don't know, hanging out somewhere. I don't know where he lives, actually. I don't know if he has a Messiah house or a temple or whatever they built for him, but there's somebody there who's claiming to be the Messiah, and, and the, these Jews have been fooled by that, and they're in, in talks with him. I, I don't know what there is to negotiate if, if Jesus, if the Messiah is here. Growing up, uh, every Passover, when we had Passover, we would put out something called the um, uh, Kos Eliyahu, or the Elijah Cup. It was at the end of the, of the Passover service, you would put this cup with a little bit of wine on it, and you'd set it out, and then you'd open the door a crack. That's when it was safe to do so, I guess. And you'd leave the door open, and then we would go have Kaddish. We would have a meal, and we would wait, and Elijah would visit all of the Jewish homes. It was so weird because it's almost like Santa comes to everybody's home and has milk and cookies. Elijah would come to all these Jewish homes that were having Passover and drink a little wine, and we would wait still for Elijah to usher in the Messiah. Little did I know during those days that the Messiah has already come and that we are simply waiting for his return. But that's not the way it is with everybody. And people are being fooled. If you don't know the truth, you are easily subject to a lie. It's just, you know, someone said, if you say something long enough, even you start to believe it. And I, I guess that's true. But, it, you know, I remember, I think it, was, it may have been my grandpa who told me once. He said, if you tell someone there's 20 billion stars in the sky, they'll believe you. If you tell them there's 200, they're going to want you to name them all. Right? And so it's easy to be fooled when we don't have the truth under, under our belts. We have to be absolutely grounded in the truth of in the Word of God, or else we also will be subject to false claims and to false teachings. Even worse, we may repeat those things and falsely teach others. And that is a far more grave <clears throat> situation. But there's more. Luke 21, 11, I know we read some of this in Matthew, but it says there will be great earthquakes and there will be famines. And there will be plagues in many lands and there will be terrifying things and great miraculous signs from heaven. It's going to come quickly and it's all going to happen so fast that at some point it'll be too late for us to begin to build our faith. At some point it'll be too late for us to pick a side. It will be chosen for us if we don't choose it. When we end up outside the wire, we had better know whom we serve and, and who we worship. Because if we don't make the choice freely, uh, that choice will be made for us. And it's, it's not like it's hard. You know, in prayer and meditation and in reading uh, through the Bible, you know one of the things I love about sermons it's not necessarily getting up and doing them. It's preparing for them. Because it's an intense period of Bible study for me and research in order to, to do a sermon. And the more I do that, the closer I get to God. The closer I get to Jesus. And the more in tune I am with my relationship with the Holy Spirit. And the closer I am in that relationship, the more that I allow the Holy Spirit to abide in me, the easier it is to deal with what's coming. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I don't know, if, if you want to be an engineer and you just decide to go to work for an engineering firm and they hand you some engineering things or plans and you don't know anything about engineering, you're in a world of hurt. 
But if you go to school or, or not school, but one way or another, and you study engineering for years and years and years, and you become a competent engineer, and you go somewhere and somebody gives you engineering plans, you feel you're not worried, you're not scared, you feel competent and comfortable in it. We've got to draw closer to Jesus during these final times because there will come a time when the, the, these events will increase so rapidly that there will not be time for us then to try to work on our relationship with Jesus. We need to be in that place right now, today. Revelation 8, 7 to 13 says, The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star, blazing like a torch, fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair calling out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of earth, because the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. That sounds pretty scary. That sounds like something even Hollywood couldn't create, right? And so, um, should we live in fear? Do we live in fear because of what's coming? in the end days? No, because we will be protected. God says in the very beginning in Deuteronomy, he says, I will not leave you and I will not forsake you. <coughs> he will protect us as a, as a hen protects its chicks under its wings. <coughs> but what we have to understand is that hope is not a strategy. And no amount of hope that this isn't going to happen is going to change it, right? So for me, it's not devastating, scary, depressing times. I hesitate to say it's pretty exciting. It's pretty exciting. If I'm still alive to see this happen, man, the stories we'll get to tell in heaven, those who made it through this, you know, who survived until the end, who were translated when Jesus comes. And those who are in the grave, they don't have to worry about it because they get to sleep peacefully through this time and the next thing they know, well, there's Jesus and the angels taking us up to be with him. So what is it that we have to be afraid of? Nothing. You know, even in this whole, now we have another surge of another variant of the pandemic. What do we have to be afraid of? Nothing. Because we shouldn't be afraid of that which takes our life. All that does is it, is it puts us in a place where we are prepared to now see the Lord. But we have to be ready in our hearts now because we don't know when that time is going to come. Have we been forewarned? Well, in the great controversy, uh, Miss White writes this. She says, when God sends to men warnings so important that they are represented as proclaimed by holy angels flying in the midst of heaven, he requires every person endowed with reasoning powers to heed the message. And we have the three angels' message, don't we? I always thought that was interesting in the last verse in Revelation 8, starting in 7. Everything's in thirds. A third, a third, a third. Three angels' proclamation. We have the three angels' message that we have um, for our church. It says, The fearful judgments denounced against the worship of the beast and his image should lead all to a diligent study of the prophecies to learn what the mark of the beast is and how they are to avoid receiving it. I love that it says that he requires every person endowed with reasoning powers to heed the message. You know, there are those who don't have reasoning powers. There are those who don't have it because they've exhausted it. There are those that don't have it because they don't want to have it. There are those that suffer from uh, mental disabilities that maybe don't have that ability. Our job is to help those people yeah. out, right? Our job is to be there for those who don't believe because maybe they can't believe, 
or because they're not endowed with reasoning powers. And our job is to be there to witness to them. Now, we don't carry the sinner, we carry the message. That's the best that we can do. But is that enough? Well, we continue to read on in the great controversy. It says, but the masses of the people turn away their ears from hearing the truth and are turned unto fables. The Apostle Paul declared, looking down to the last days, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. What does that mean? The time will come when they refuse to listen to the truth. We had a conversation the other day about um, you know, someone I, I know, people I know that are close to me that may not be in heaven, may not make it. Am I sad about that? You know, it's hard because I don't want to seem unfeeling or indifferent. But those people who don't want to be there, if God were to force them to spend eternity somewhere where they didn't want to be, that would be like being in hell, in my mind. If I had to be somewhere, if you said to me, you're going to spend the rest of your life in a noisy airport, I'd rather die. And there are people who, who don't want this, who have heard the truth and have rejected it. It's not like they're ignorant to it. They've been preached the truth. They've been taught the truth. They've heard it. And they've openly and willingly rejected it because it's just not something they want. And God loves us so much that he allows us to experience that free will, the consequences of our free will. Otherwise, everybody would be there. And then we'd have a bunch of miserable people in heaven, and it wouldn't be heaven anymore. The time will come, it says, when they won't endure sound doctrine. Where you can teach till you're blue in the face, and people are going to make a choice to turn away from the truth. Because the truth does not comport with what they believe the truth should be. Because the truth does not align with what they think, what they want, what their desires of the flesh are. The time has fully come. The multitudes do not want Bible truth because it interferes with the desires of the sinful, world-loving heart. And Satan supplies the descriptions which they love. So, I think this is why our heart groans, but I don't think it's why we should be sad because God is allowing everyone that freedom of choice. And if he didn't, there would be no free will and this would be a totalitarian religion that we were in and that's just not the way it is. All right, so there are five steps to get ready. Five steps that I know of in my, in my belief to do this. Number one, we have to get right with God. We have to be at peace with God before we move further and do anything else. Number two, we have to be at peace with ourselves. We have to be okay with who we are, with our limitations and our defects and the fact that with our human nature and our relationship with God. And then we have to be at peace with other people. Because whether you realize it or not, I believe this is absolutely true, that anything that stands between you and another person will stand between you and God. Before you come to communion next week, if you're going to take communion, you need to work to resolve anything that's between you and another person. Those first three steps for each of us are critical before communion next week. We need to get right with God, we need to get right with ourselves, and we need to be at peace with others. And then it's just practice, practice, practice. You have to practice it all the time. How many of you... Uh, uh, can say that you practice these spiritual principles unceasingly, without exception, all the time, and never fall short of it. Because I can't. You know, it's like wind up, do it, 20 minutes later going, oh, wow, what happened? How did I get here? You know, how did I forget these principles again? And then we have to be of service to others. So, so we we get right with God, we're okay with ourselves, we make peace with other people, we do this a lot, and once we become good at it, then we can go out and we can start to help other people.
to come to the place that we are. Number one, surrendering our will to God's will. Uh, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through God who strengthens me. Um, in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen? Amen. And we get right with ourselves. This is being at peace with ourselves, and this comes through confession and repentance. We, we need to look in the mirror and really come to understand who we are. Not judging ourselves based on our values and morals, but judging ourselves based on seeing us through the eyes of Jesus. All of our righteousness is filthy rags. I'm sure we look disgusting sometimes in Jesus' eyes. And we have to recognize that. And then through confessing those sins and repentance, which means truly in our hearts, not doing this anymore or doing our best not to do those things anymore, brings us to peace with God. Psalm 32, 5 says, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity, I have not hidden, I said. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sins. Selah. Amen. James 5.16 says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And 1 Samuel 7.3.4 says, Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, if you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths from among you and prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only. What is that? And serve him only. We don't share our worship with anyone else but God. And he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the children of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtoreths and serve the Lord only. That is an admonition to us. We need to put away those things that stand between us and God. We need to put away those things that we worship, whether, no, I don't, whatever it is, money or, or children or things or people or places, whatever it is, we need to set those aside and we need our focus to be solely on God, solely on God. And then he'll begin to remove from us those defects of character that keep us from, our, from building a perfect relationship with him. Number three is we have to be at peace with others. Number one is making amends to others. So it's not just about those who we have resentments against, but also to get right with those who may have resentments against us. Remember, the Bible says that before you go and sacrifice at the altar, if your brother has aught against you, so if somebody's got a problem with me, I need to go try to figure that out. Before I come to communion is basically what it's saying. It's interesting in Judaism, how we would do it is that I would go and apologize to you sincerely three times. And after the third time, if you don't accept the apology, I give it to God. It's no longer on me. It's no longer between you and I anymore. It's on God. Because others, if we rely solely upon other human beings to forgive us before we move forward in our relationship with Christ, then we will be stymied at times because there are those people who will not do that. They will hold that resentment or that grudge forever. They'll take it to their graves. That's not on us. We are to do our very best at that time uh, to do it. Matthew 5, 23, 26. I know that's small. I apologize. It says, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there, oh, well, here it is. Remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift before the altar. Go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you are thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there until you have paid the last penny. What does that mean, to pay the last penny? I went and did some research on this. It's talking about until you have completely gotten rid of that resentment until you've been able to resolve that problem you will be stuck in prison and are we in prison 
If you have a resentment against somebody else or somebody else has a resentment against you that you have not resolved, are we in prison? Feels that way sometimes, doesn't it? Right? Romans 12, 18, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible says, if it is possible, let's start there, if it's possible, meaning that sometimes it's not possible, right? As much as depends on you, meaning that we can't leave this to other people, live peaceably with all men. So does it say that we have to live peaceably with all men? No. It says that as much as is possible, as it depends on me, I have to live peaceably with all men. But sometimes <clears throat> it's not possible. But I have to do my best. Number four is just practice, practice, practice. It's about discipline and self-control. Philippians 4, 4 through 9 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness of nature be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. And what's the next word? With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So that's a good start, right? That's a lot. I probably should have separated these two. Because the next part says, finally, brethren, <clears throat> whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, just, pure, lovely, whatever things are of good report, and by the way, that's not gossip. That's good report. If there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. You know, I, I, I know the question comes up a, a lot of times to people. What's the first thing you want to do when you go to heaven? You know, I want to meet Abraham and ask him a question. I want to meet Jesus and give him a hug or whatever. I want to go to my cabin out in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And since time is, is eternal, maybe for the first 10 or 15,000 years, sit on the porch of that cabin in a rocking chair and just observe nature and the quiet and the peacefulness without the noise and the confusion. <clears throat> I strive for peace in my life, but not the peace that comes in this world because that peace still has noise. I want the peace that God brings us that exceeds all human understanding. And then be of service to others. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan? We're to carry the message of God through our actions. You know, it says, people go, well, we're not, a, we're not a, a belief of actions. You don't get to heaven by your works. No, but your works do reflect your faith because we're told specifically that a good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad fruit, a bad tree can't produce good fruit and that you'll know the quality of that person by the fruit that they produce by the actions that they take. For many people, remember, their very first view of Jesus will be us. Some people, the first time they get to see God will be through you. And what is it that you represent to that person? Who is Jesus Christ? In Christ's Objects Lessons, Miss White writes this. Christ's followers have been redeemed for service. Our Lord teaches that the true object of life is ministry. Christ himself was a worker, and to all his followers he gives the law of service, service to God and to their fellow men. Here, Christ has presented to the world a higher conception of life than they have ever known. By living to minister for others, man is brought into connection with Christ. The law of service becomes the connecting link which binds us to God and to our fellow men. You want to get out of your own head? Go help someone else. You want to get out of feeling miserable? Go be of service to somebody else. Do it anonymously or do it openly. Watch that person's face. See how they feel when somebody comes up to help them in their time of need. So I'm going to close with this. I have a preparedness checklist. I believe there are 18 items on here. So you might think you have to memorize them all, but the truth is all you got to do is read the verse at the end. And that's where this comes from. <clears throat> Number one, let love be without hypocrisy. Number two, abhor what is evil. Number three, cling to what is good. That kind of diametrically opposed there. I guess that that might be a little easier to do than we think. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love 
in honor, giving preference to one another, giving them the big piece of the pie, letting them cut into traffic, being stuck at a light because you let them make it through instead. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit and serving the Lord. Number six, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Number seven, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Number eight, bless those who persecute you and bless and do not curse them. Number nine, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That's talking about um, emotional intelligence and empathy. Number 10, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Number 12, do not be wise in your own opinion. <coughs> if I'm right, it's because the Holy Spirit has impressed me to be right. If I'm not impressed, I'm wrong. I'll tell you that most of the time. <laughs> Number 13, repay no one evil for evil. <clears throat> Basically, it's not about you. Get over yourself. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Number 15, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Number 16, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. Step aside. Stand down. Because it's written that vengeance is mine. <clears throat> I will repay, says the Lord. God forbid you do something revengeful on another person. And in God's eyes, that's wrong. Maybe that person was just shy of being saved. Maybe you made them give up five minutes before the miracle. God help us if we step in the way of God doing his work and interfere. I think that was Gamaliel's warning, right? If, they're, if it's not of God, then they'll meet their own demise. But if they are of God, heaven help us, he said, if we choose to get in there and interfere with God's work. Number 17, therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. I always had a hard time with that one. Mm -hmm. I just pictured hair on fire, <laughs> blisters on their scalp. You know. But what it's saying is that by pouring this love out to them who think that they're your enemies, treating them as your friends, their hearts will soften, not just for you, but when the heart softens, the Holy Spirit can come in and work. Amen. And finally, number 18, Doris, that's your sign. Uh, do not overcome evil by evil, but overcome evil with good. So if you want to memorize those 18, just go to Romans 12, 9 to 21. So that's not the world according to Frank. That's not my checklist. That comes directly from the Word of God. And if we're going to do things right, we're going to do things by the Word of God. Amen? Doris, thank you. <clears throat> well, as is my custom, I have a challenge for you. That sermon's a lot to take in. I mean, it's just a lot. So I'm going to try and summarize it this way in preparing for, for communion next week. Just do the next right thing. That's it. Whatever is in front of you, just do the next right thing. And that will carry you till next Sabbath. And it will draw you closer to God. Amen? Amen. And close in our usual way. Yirecha Adonai v'yishmarecha ya'ar Adonai panavalecha v'ikunecha Yisau Adonai panavalecha v'yashamlecha shalom May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right. Happy Sabbath.